God bless you. Amen. Amen. I'm so blessed to be here. Amen. Spring is so beautiful. The flowers, the grass. Today was just an amazing sunny day. I learned that daffodils, they're annuals. And they pop up every spring without you having to replant them. I mean, th that's an amazing thing from a girl who lived in the South Bronx that used to pick up weeds because they were like cute little flowers and give them to mommy and say, here, mommy, a pretty flower. That's a big thing. And this just reminds me of Jonathan, my son, my eight-year-old. And we went to my, well, his titi's house, his aunt's. And he looks at the front of their yard. They have a front, small little section. And he says, Ma, look at that. He runs inside and he says, Titi, you have weed city growing in the front of your house. And she just laughs because if you know, my, if you know Mildred, she's just a wonderful, amazing person. She went to missions with us. And some of us, we, we know how she just laughs at everything and thinks everything is okay. And she says, no, I like it. I like the little flowers. They look pretty. So Jonathan, he just looks at me, and he's cute because he loves all kinds of nature. And he just looks at me, he says, ma, is she serious? Doesn't she know that these are weeds? Doesn't she know that if they continue to grow, they're going to spread and kill her grass? And kill her pretty pink flowers that are in the back. And then the ones that have the puffy little blowing things go flying to somebody else's yard and contaminates their soil. Too. I'm like, what in the world? This little boy? Where are you getting this from? I was like shocked. And it reminded me of today's scripture. Spring is the beginning of new life new birth, new things. And there was a point in our life that we were regenerated in the new. When our Savior gave our dead spirit life and breathed in us his Holy Spirit. And he dwells within us. Well, sometimes in this fresh green spring awakening, some weeds creep in. And we don't think it's a problem at first. When in fact, if you don't pull them out, they will grow inside of you. They will grow within your home. They will grow within your ministry and to your church. Contamination of good soil with wrong doctrine. My word today is quench. Quench. And quench is to stifle to squash, like an annoying bug, you just want to squash it. It's to muffle. It reminds me of somebody trying to speak and you're putting your hands in their mouth and all you hear, that's all you hear. It reminds me of when you snuff a candle. Another thing I learned, the, the cap of the candle, that's what you're used to turn off the fire, not blow it and everything just splatters and smoke and everything. That's called to snuff out the fire. This is what the Apostle Paul is warning us today against concerning a powerful, all-knowing, godly spirit, the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. A spirit that is, a call, is calling to you, to me, and has a calling for you and for me. A spirit that will bring you a special and divine revelation. Now let's get something clear right off the back. To believe that an omnipotent and a sovereign and an all-powerful, all-knowing God can be quenched and restricted by little old me and little old us in what he might want us to do in our lives and in the life of the local church, that's crazy to think that. Because who can stop the Lord Almighty? Just because God's spirit can be quenched, it doesn't mean that we have 
the final decisive control over this mighty and powerful God. It just means that God, for wise and holy reasons, he often allows us to resist him. He allows us, and allows is the operative word. Remember, his thoughts are not our thoughts. To muffle, to snuff, to stifle the Holy Spirit is no joke. And yet, even in this, God is still merciful. God is still merciful. He's still loving. It's so obvious that he can overrule resistance. He can. But he chooses always to be a gentleman, a father, and a teacher, a revealer of the truth. So I want us to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 24. And this is where our scripture is found. 1 Thessalonians If we can stand for the reading of the word, just out of reverence. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we read this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 24. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Father. Today I would like to discuss four ways we can quench the Holy Spirit. Number one would be by despising some biblical gifts of the Holy Spirit. Number two is neglecting some gifts that we have inside of us. Number three would be shutting down our emotions and refusing to give the Holy Spirit free expression to them. And number four is resisting the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Grace, that's gracious behavior that comes from the Spirit himself. I get that from Ephesians 4.30 where it talks about grieving Grieving the Holy Spirit. And I think grieving and quenching, they, they're very similar. They go close together. We will also look at this on Sunday. Paul says that God has granted us Christians, children of God, the ability to either restrict or release, birth, what the Spirit does in the life of our church together corporately. The Spirit comes as a fire, and we can fan it into flame, just as 2 Timothy 1.6 says, or we can extinguish it with the human fear that we sometimes have, with control that we sometimes want, and with flawed theology. That just means messed up biblical teaching. Number one, to despise the spiritual supernatural, biblical gifts, the works of the spirit. How many of us actually pause to kind of consider if we are in any way quenching the spirit's work in our lives, individually and corporately in the church, and maybe we don't even realize it. 
We quench the spirit whenever we diminish his personality. And we speak of him as if he were abstract. He's like invisible, intangible. We can't reach him. It, God is our lifeline. He is not a power source of divine energy that's floating around in the atmosphere. He is God. And like Pastor Ephraim said, that he is the only power, that dynamite power that we need to survive in this world. Over our life, you don't get and you don't get the Holy Spirit. It isn't something that you say, I'm going to get the Holy Spirit. No. If you are a believer, he is already inside of you. Romans 8, 9 says... And the Bible says, if you do not have the spirit, you are none of mine. But if you are a believer, the Holy Spirit is already within you. Like he is, it's like you think he's like an electrical current that you can maybe just stick your finger inside of it. And, and the anointing is just going to jolt out. But when you are home, you're like, you don't get that feeling. You're just like, hmm. And, and like I heard a preacher once say a long, long time ago, when you're driving down the road and you pass the speed limit, the Holy Spirit gets up and walks away from you because of your disobedience. That's incorrect theology. That's what you call bad biblical teaching. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit because he is a person you take him with you during your disobedience. He doesn't walk away. He doesn't turn his face. He is there with you, right there in the presence of your choice. Ephesians 4.30 sorry, says, And don't, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. That's grieving. Remember that he has identified you as his own. He's guaranteed that you will be saved on that day of redemption. Your sin is not more powerful than what Jesus did on the cross. His spirit does not leave you. But does that mean you can willingly continue to sin? Because of his grace and forgiveness is so plentiful? No way. Romans 6, 2 says, God forbid. That would just show a misunderstanding of his abundant grace that you have. It shows a mocking of what Jesus did on the cross. And that's beyond disrespectful. We quench the spirit whenever we suppress or we give specific rules on how the spirit should move within us and even within the body of Christ. We set rules against his work. Now, I am definitely not against order. God is a God of order, and he is perfect in the way that he moves. But I'm talking about the fleshly desires of man to just rule against the spirit's move. And how he's imparting spiritual gifts and ministering to the church through them. Every gift of the spirit in its own is a way of the Holy Spirit manifesting, manifesting himself and moving within us. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 talks about a spiritual gift is given to each of us. So we can help each other. We are to help each other when we come together as a body. We are to pray for one another. We are to speak life to one another. To look at the eyes of your brothers and sisters and speak life coming from the spirit that is within us. That sometimes we don't even know what they are going through, but the spirit speaks speaks, interceding for that person, and you're just going to say that word. But we don't. We don't. 
The spirit is made visibly evident in his manifestation. And when he moves within and amongst us, whenever his gifts are in use. Number two, neglecting some gifts that we have in us. Spiritual gifts are the presence of the spirit himself showing us how to do ministry, how to do life. It is our purpose. So you have a very, you have these very intelligent Christians, I believe they're called the cessationalists, that they don't believe that the operation of the miraculous gifts is biblically allowed. This just quenches the spirit and his move. This is unbiblical restrictions and it stifles. It inhibits what the spirit can do individually and corporately in our church family. We quench the spirit whenever we structure everything so rigidly that we don't allow the move of his spirit. And Paul in Ephesians 15, 519 says, oh, and also in Colossians 316, it refers to spiritual spontaneous songs. As soon as I wrote this, my watch started to say your heart rate is going up. And I just started to cry. And I just started to think of, of the song, fill the room, fill the room, fill the room. And I'm like, God, if that's not spontaneous, if that's not your spirit. And when Pastor Ray comes up here and says, Clarabelco, Clarabelco, and, and she just sings, and the spirit, and when Brittany comes here, and she sings, and the spirit, you can feel the move. You can feel the move. And it's prompted by the spirit, and it's appropriate to a spirit-filled moment in the service. Because God is a God of order, but he is still a God of spontaneity because he wants to do something new within the church. New wine, pressing out new wine. He wants to do something new. And I see it. It is possible that we could quench the Spirit's work by denying the possibility that he might move upon us in this spontaneous way like this because we are so rigid sometimes. We're so OCD and things have to be in a certain place, in a certain order. We're so kind of strict and grumpy. He can't interrupt our precious schedule. Now concerning prophetic speaking in 1 Corinthians 14 29 through 31 the spirit has the capability to reveal something to a person at the same time another person is speaking that is in 1 Corinthians 14 29 through 31 I think I have it here Let two or three people prophesy and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember, that the people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. Thank you, Carl. Excuse me. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. God is a God of order. 
This too, though, is spontaneous. And it's happening and is not to be despised. It's not to be scorned. But it's to be embraced as Paul counsels in the passage of Scripture. The person speaking to be silent and giving room for the other to communicate whatever the spirit is made known. We quench the spirit when we despise prophetic utterances. 1 Thessalonians 5.20 No matter how people may have abused the gift, the Apostle Paul says it clearly. It is disobedient to the scripture. In other words, it's a sin to despise prophetic utterances. God commands us to treat prophecy not actually, God commands us not to treat prophecy with contempt as if it was unimportant. Rather than quenching the Holy Spirit by despising prophetic utterances, Paul tells us, just test everything. Just have discernment. Test everything. It says it in his word. Paul tells us 521, meaning examine Judge the prophecy. Read his word. Paul doesn't correct the abuse of this gift because clearly there are some. But, and he doesn't command don't prophesy anymore because this is not working. He doesn't do that either. It, he remedies, a remedy is biblical informed discernment and only holding fast to what is true and good. This discernment should be applied to all the spiritual gifts. When we fail to lead people in knowing the life in the spirit, what the life in the spirit is, we quench and we muffle the spirit. Our job is to teach. Our job is to love. Our job is to know God, know, love, serve. First one is know. We have to know our God by reading his word and understanding what he's commanding from us and what he's gifted us with and the power that he has given us through his spirit. Number three, shutting down our emotions and refusing to give the Holy Spirit free expression to them. So we quench the Holy Spirit whenever we suppress or we make rules or we instill fear in the hearts of other people regarding the legitimate and true heartfelt experiences, emotions and affections in worship. We, I've heard people say you shouldn't be an emotional Christian. You know, I find it so cool that Jesus, he worshiped his father. I find it instructive to us that he describes, he's described as rejoicing in the Lord. He, he, utterly rejoicing in the presence of his father. Affection for God such as joy, love, peace, a zeal for the things of the Lord a desire to want to be in his presence, a reverent fear and awe of his majesty. They're all key to worshiping in spirit and in truth. How often do we place these strict guidelines sometimes in ourselves, in ourselves of what is proper in times of worship? What we do is we quench the spirit when your heart is pounding and you know that the Lord is calling you to come to his altar and you don't because you wonder what the other person is thinking. You don't want to look like a fool. You don't want to stand up. You don't want to sing. You don't want to worship. You stand with your arms closed. You sit with your arms crossed. I don't care who sees me. I don't care who hears me. I will run to this altar and I will pour out 
up my praise as an offering, as an incense, as an aroma to my God. And if I have to scream, I will scream and I have. If, I, if my spirit speaks utterances of words in other tongues and I have to sit, stand the kneel there and God has to speak to me, I will not stifle what he is doing, what he is birthing within me. Who am I to stop what God is doing in my heart? And there are times that I sit there and I just want to lay on the floor and cry because God has just been so good. Even in the lowest valleys, God has been so good. The spirit overflows in appropriate expressions like melodies in our heart. It reminds me of Noemi's flute. It's expressions of melodies of worship and adoration. It's like rivers of living water that just flows and up and down. And if you don't like those expressions and you resist it, and you fold your arms and you say, I'm not going to do that sort of thing. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to speak out. What are people going to think? What are they going to say? I'm going to look like a fool. This is unorganized. We're quenching the Holy Spirit is what we do. By despising some gifts of the Holy Spirit, by neglecting the gifts that he's given us, by shutting down our emotions and refusing to give the Holy Spirit expression and muffling his voice. Lastly, number four, resisting the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That is the gracious behavior that God has given us the capability to grow and be. And it comes from him. Ephesians 4.30 talks about grieving the spirit. And I truly believe that grieving and quenching, as I said before, they're very close together. But let, but let me read from 29 through 32, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember that he has identified you as his own. He guaranteed that you will be saved on the day of, of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. He's speaking to the believer. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage, anger. Get rid of the harsh words. Get rid of the slander. As we all, as, as well as all types of evil behavior instead, be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We have a command not to grieve the spirit. We have these exhortations to be kind, to be gracious to those you really don't feel like being gracious to at times. To be loving toward your family when you go home and there's dishes piling up in the sink and you have chores that you've given your, your children and, and there are certain things that you expect to be done that are not done. And then when you open your mouth, words that you don't even know where they came from come out. You blow your top instead of instructing. You curse instead of teaching. God calls us to live out the fruit of the Holy Spirit and not quench with these attitudes. 
It stifles the spiritual gifts that he wants to grow within us. It stops it. He's working a good work within you. He is creating something new within you. But these weeds start popping up out of nowhere, it seems. But God wants you to just pause, be still, and allow him to speak to you, to your spirit. He is the one that... that prays for us. He's our advocate. And he's praying and speaking at that very moment. We must think of these things when we wonder why we're not moving forward. Why are we not moving forward in the calling that God has for us? We are created for purpose on purpose. I may urge, may I urge you to carefully just, and me too, search our hearts and ask what might be the possible ways that I may have quenched the spirit in my own heart, in my own life, in the experience of my own church, the body of Christ, my church family making room for the Spirit's work in us, in the midst of the body, in the midst of the body of Christ, the church is not to be feared. The move of the Spirit is not to be feared. It is to be fostered, cultivated. May God grant us all the wisdom and the confidence in his goodness to fan that fire for, for greater, more life-changing experience of the Spirit's transforming power over us. And let us pray. Let us bow our heads. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the words that you've spoken to me and my heart, the way that you teach me father i pray that we would keep these words i pray father god that when you speak we would listen i pray father god that when your holy spirit wants to speak through us that we would not stifle it that when our Holy Spirit that is living inside of us, that when you want our feet to move towards someone that is in need, that we would not disobediently stay at our chair. I pray. I pray for your utterances, your, your otherworldly words, Father God. I pray for the river of waters to quench our thirst. I pray, Father, the, for the interpretation of tongues. And I pray that your move, which is perfect and orderly, would just sweep us away in your presence. I pray, oh God. I pray, oh God. Bring revelation to your church. Bring revelation to your church, my God. Do not keep your voice silent. Do not have fear or doubt. The Lord calls us not to have fear or doubt. You do feel him moving. You feel him moving like living waters within you. When you're embarrassed to come to the altar. When you're hearing his voice. His spirit wants to empower you. His spirit wants to blaze within you like a dynamite of power supernatural spiritual power that is true that is real only those who
who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit is speaking and saying. God's wisdom is not the world's wisdom. It's not our own wisdom. Patience, joy, love doesn't come from us, comes from Him. Father, Father, there's so many worries. Father, there's so many worries. There are so many worries in the people of God. There are, are mountains that don't seem to want to move, Lord. And it just stifles them. And it just stops. There are things that are too heavy. Too heavy on the heart of your people, my God. But I pray. I pray that you would allow them to get up because they are more than conquerors. And that they would speak to that mountain. And it will move by the power of your spirit that is living within them and in me, God. For you said greater things than these we will do. Father, help your people to learn how to pray and rebuke, and rebuke worry, and rebuke anger, and rebuke grief that is overtaking their souls, that rebuke lasciviousness, rebuke, Lord God. Even your word talks about the spirit of laziness, my Lord. Allow your spirit to speak to one another. Work in their minds in this moment. Draw to remembrance the time that they were asked by your sweet spirit to speak, to let go, to forgive, to surrender. Father, I ask that your spirit would move in a mighty and in a new way. For you are making all things new. For our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heavens and earth. And you said that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will rise up with wings like the eagles. They will walk and not be weary. They will run and not grow faint, my God. Help us to rise higher, higher where the enemy cannot reach us, deeper into your presence. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we thank you. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your words of wisdom over our life. And we pray that you never leave our side and that we will not quiet your spirit. In Jesus' precious name, we ask all these things. Amen. And God bless you.